morning, Cynthia Baptist Church. Glad to see everybody's here, but I also see that a lot of people are still celebrating the New Year's out traveling, being with family. So, speaking of which, though, I hope everybody here had a great time with the holidays. Merry Christmas. I hope you had time to spend time with your family, your friends. Basically, it's a great time to reflect upon those that you do remember the most. Um, getting into the announcements and stuff, you guys do have a bulletin here in your hands, so there are a lot of things to read, lots of things to kind of look at. But the uh, biggest thing I want to look at right here is they're updating the information books. So if you've got a contact information change, you wish to be added to the information book, know someone who wished to be added to the book. So please bring those to the office, let that be known, so we can update that information and pass it along to everybody. Uh, of course, you got CBC Food Bank. You, you can kind of see what they're in need of there. So please uh, support monetary or make donations, whatever you feel brings to your heart. So shall we uh, go to the Lord in prayer and start to serve supper? Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so very much for bringing us into this new year. Thank you for the opportunity to come to this church, to listen to the music, to listen to the words that our pastor brings to us. Please open our ears, open our heart to receive this information and basically make us a better person, make us a better, better member in, in your life. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's special name. Amen. Amen. Good morning and Happy New Year again. Uh, first Sunday of a new year, a time to remember, a time to anticipate, a time to look back, a time to look forward. You know, remembering is a holy act. It's an act we're told to do. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We did that last week. But we're also told to remember the way the Lord has led us to people of Israel were told, the whole commandment that I command you today, you should be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. This was Moses talking to the people of Israel just before they were getting ready to cross the Jordan into the promised land. He went on to say, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I hope you've had a time to think over what the Lord has done this past year. Remember the good things, remember the tough times and how he's been graciously and sufficiently with us. This morning we want to stand and say thank you and say, Lord, we will remember and we will give you thanks. We will remember we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. Let's do it again. We will. We will remember, we will remember, we will remember the works of your hands. We will stop and give you praise, for great is thy faithfulness. You're our creator, you're our creator, our life sustainer, deliverer, our comfort, our joy. Throughout the ages, you've been our shelter, our peace in the midst of the storm. With signs and wonders, you showed your power. With precious blood, you showed us your grace. You've been our helper, our liberator, the giver of life with no end. We will remember. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let earth and heaven, let earth and heavenly saints proclaim. Glory and higher and greater will. 
take our seats, please. Good morning. Happy New Year. It's good to be in God's house today. I know it's nice and dreary outside, but we've got warm hearts in here. And we're going to get into God's Word this morning. A good passage of Scripture for us today, starting off a new year in Luke chapter 2. Before we begin there, let's just open up with a word of prayer this morning. Fathers, we come before you today. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this new year, this 2022 year in your calendar. And Father, we just ask that as we go before you this year that we'll see you do mighty things. Father, that you will use each one of us and you will use this church for the good of your kingdom. Father, help us to follow your word. Help us to look to it as we get into it today, Father, and apply the principles that we see here to our own lives. Father, I just ask that you use me. Father, give me the strength to preach your word with power. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, if you got your Bibles open there, we're going to open up to Luke chapter 2. We're going to pick up there in verse 41. And starting off in this new year, we're going to talk about finding some balance here in this new year. And so Luke chapter 2, starting verse 41, if you don't mind standing just for a second, as we give reverence to reading God's Word, Luke chapter 2. Every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And after the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled for a day. They began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. And then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with men. Let's be seated. Well, we're coming into a new year. We're starting off fresh. And January is usually the month when we kind of look over the past year and see if there's anything that if we might need to change around a little bit, maybe some adjustments that we might need to make in our life, something to maybe make us a little bit better. And I think with the last couple of years, the way things have been, we'd all like to see some improvement in, in several areas of our life. I, I know I would like to see some spiritual growth, maybe some financial growth, not so much some physical growth, unless I'm planning on pumping some iron here pretty soon. But, but seriously, we want to see some forward movement in, in growth in our lives. These 14 verses that we've just read over over the life of Jesus is, is an, a point in his life from a very young age all the way up to when he begins his earthly ministry around age 30. And outside of this, we don't have a whole lot of information about his childhood. Verse 40 tells us, And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And we read later that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with men. And so those are 18 years of his life. And in those 18 years, though he is God incarnate, what we see is that there is some progress in the life of Christ in his humanity. You see, beloved, we're on this Christian journey right now. And in our faith, there is a process that we're continuing to go through that causes each one of us to grow. And what I want to take from these verses this morning, kind of starting off this new year in, in a fresh place, is understand that God is doing something in your life. Amen? 
God is working in your life. And God is helping each one of us to grow into the person that he desires us to be. The question is, are we willing to let him work in us? What was it that allowed Jesus to increase in wisdom, to increase in stature, and increase in favor with God and men over those 18 years? And the thing that strikes me the most about reading through these verses is that they seem really balanced. That, that Christ in his humanity had this kind of balanced life. And I think that's what we need in our lives as well. So what I'd like to do this morning is a couple of things. First, I want to, I want to get a standard from God's Word. I think that's where we need to go. If we want to get a standard from anywhere, it is to get into God's Word. After all, the Scripture says that we are being made and molded into the image of God. And so if anybody's going to be our model, it's going to be Jesus. Amen? And so that's what I want to do first. That's our end goal there. And then I want to take it kind of dissect a little bit of the passage as we kind of go through it. So let's take a look at, at the first thing that we see here. It tells us here that he grew in wisdom. And so what is wisdom? Wisdom involves much more than just head knowledge. I think a lot of times we, we would say, okay, I've, I'm wise. I've got head knowledge in, in my head, and I'm going to apply that. No, the Proverbs tell us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So wisdom, beloved, is heavenly instruction that we receive from God's word applied then to our earthly lives. It's taking what we know about God from God's words, the principles that we get here in the Bible, and then applying them in the right way, starting first of all with what happens right here in the heart. Jesus said that everything that comes out of a man, it's not what, what we put in, it's what comes out, what, what's here first. So we get this right. We apply God's word. He, he is to guide us with word and with spirit. And it's out of that abundance that it overflows into these other areas of our lives. And it's going to affect what you say. It's going to affect what you do. It's going to affect where you go. It's going to affect all of these other aspects of your life from the wisdom that we get from God's word. So if you have a question about something, where do we go? Well, we go to God's word. We see what this has to say. Now, sometimes you might say, well, Pastor, I've got into God's Word. I've asked some questions about these certain things. And sometimes it's silent on a particular subject. Well, then, beloved, there's always principles that are kind of in behind and girded into this Word that might give us some guidance for what we're asking. So what happens then is as we learn about God, as we get closer to God, as we get into His Word, it then begins to shape our identity. That doesn't happen overnight. You guys know that. I wish it was like when I was in college. They said you could, you could lay a book underneath your pillow and, and lay down on it, and that information would just absorb in there. I, I wish it was like that. We'd stick our Bibles underneath there or lay them on our nightstand, and, and, and all night long that, that word would just be filtering in. I, I guess you could play some of those tapes with, with those guys reading through the Bible. Maybe some of that would then stick in there. But, but it's a gradual process. Is we're allowing this word to filter into us. And I'm convinced that from the viewpoint of his humanity, much of Jesus' growth in this area was directed by observing the people around him, especially his parents. And so as Mary and Joseph operated on the basis of the wisdom in their own lives, they in turn taught him how to be wise. Perhaps... At times when he was visiting with his relatives, Zachariah and Elizabeth, that they were imputing some of this knowledge to him. And other godly men and women that were within his circle and his family might have spoken into his life. The accounts of both Matthew and Luke present Mary and Joseph as being very dedicated parents. Parents that honored God. Parents that for the most part listened to what God had to say to them. And then they adjusted their lives to behave in a manner that was consistent with what they had learned from God. Perhaps a side principle that we can take from this is that be careful who you hang around with. Be careful, beloved, what you allow to influence your life. See, beloved, in all of this, there's biblical wisdom. 
Wisdom that if demonstrated in a very practical way in every day of our lives will help us grow in a positive way. Luke tells us here that every year he and his parents made the trip to Jerusalem. They're going up to observe these festivals, the law. They're going to visit the temple. And it's here in the temple that Jesus will study under wise teachers and men of God. It's interesting that Luke describes at age 12 Jesus being filled with wisdom. And yet over the next 18 years, he continues to increase in wisdom. I don't know about you guys, but if our Lord in his humanity needed to grow in his understanding of wisdom, imagine just how much more we, fallible human beings, need to grow in our understanding of God's word. Let me just pause here for a second and say that there is no other way to do that apart from Jesus Christ. There is no other way that you can grow in the wisdom of God if you do not have the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church to say this, to those who are called both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So, beloved, the only way that you can ever develop wisdom in your life is to commit your life to Christ. As Jesus later tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And your focus has to be on growing closer to God each and every day. The second thing that he grew in that we see in our passage is stature. And that's a reference to our physical growth. And though there's, we really don't have a lot of textual evidence here about how God grew physically, We know what a toll that his ministry took on his body in the three years of his ministry. And so I think it's safe to assume that Jesus took care of his body as he grew up physically to handle the ministry that was given to him by his father. And so this word is very relevant and practical. We know that we can take this word and apply it to our lives. And you might say, well, pastor, most of our focus in church is supposed to be spiritual development. It doesn't really concern itself with the way we grow physically. Not at all. There's ample spiritual support here for us to take care of our bodies. Even the Old Testament, many of the commands that God gave his people regarding things like what they would eat, how they were to prepare those things, all were there to teach them how to remain healthy. So this word outlines steps that were taken when somebody was sick. It tells them about things that they need to do that would make them unhealthy. And so for those of us who have committed our lives to Christ and have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us, there is need to take care of ourselves physically. The Word tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we need to take reasonable steps to take care of what God has given us. Now, I'm not going to make this a, a lesson on physical fitness today because most of us know what we need to do. But, beloved, it's important that you eat the right things, that you get proper nutrition. It's important that you apply good judgment when you take things in to consume them so that you can stay healthy. That includes alcohol and tobacco and other harmful chemicals that may hinder your your growth and your walk with Christ. We need to make sure that we get enough exercise. We find this word that that Jesus mainly walked everywhere. So I'm not going to say, hey, everybody, let's start walking everywhere because I don't think that that would be good advice here. But you know what you need to be healthy. We need to get enough sleep so that we can function properly. God did create a day and night cycle. He did put a day at the end of the week so that we can get some rest. And so all of these things that we see and apply from Scripture are good for us. Now, obviously, the hard part about all of this is having the willpower, then, to apply these things and put them into practice. We know what we're supposed to do. We just have to do it. The third thing that we see here is that he grew in favor with God, and that, beloved, is our spiritual growth. That's what we like to emphasize here at church. It seems pretty odd, though, for Luke to write that Jesus grew in favor with God. I mean, after all, he is God, right? He's 100% God. He is God incarnate, and yet he grows in favor with God. One of the things that 
we talk about is how Jesus willingly yielded many of his aspects of his divinity during this time that he was in his humanity. So he gained with favor with God by seeking the Father's will. And so just like each one of us, we say, I'm trying to find what God's will is for my life and follow that. That's what the Lord was doing. He, he was being obedient to the call that was placed upon him. That's the very character he develops in that early part of his life. I mean, think about it. He's going to the temple at age 12. How many 12-year-olds do you know get excited about going to church? He's asking spiritual questions. He's rationally thinking about things in a biblical way. And then, beloved, this 12-year-old boy is talking about the Word. That's how you grow spiritually. That's the model that we're to follow here. And again, if Jesus in his humanity needed to grow spiritually in his relationship with God the Father, then we obviously need to be doing that consistently in our lives as well. Word teaches that we should be in prayer to God. We should talk daily with Him. That there is a need for us to be here at church. And there's very little reason that should keep us from meeting at, as a body of believers. Jesus went to the temple faithfully with His family. He asked questions. He, he sought godly counsel from folks that He trusted. There's biblical instruction here that we can then draw on as this truth comes out of God's Word. And we take all that we're given here and we put it into practice. We apply wisdom. We listen to the call that is upon each one of your lives. You take action in cooperation with the word that is working in you and the spirit that is drawing you closer to God. And that's how you grow spiritually. Lastly, we see that he grew in favor with men. The fact that Jesus increased in favor with men certainly does not mean that everyone liked him. In fact, from what we learned throughout Scripture, there, there were many people that despised the Lord. There were even people that wanted him dead when he was doing what God called him to do. He even warned us as his followers that when we did what God called us to do, we would be despised as well. And so what does it mean to grow in favor with men? Well, from this particular passage, it's his interaction with other people. Overall, he had a good attitude. What we see from Jesus is he is listening well. He is responding with wisdom that he had. And later, we learn from the Gospels and throughout his life, that as he went about teaching and preaching and interacting with folks, he's got a good character. He's got a good attitude. He's ministering to folks. Throughout his lifetime, though some disliked him, overall, the character that he has was one of good repose. And that leads other people to speak highly of him. The bottom line here is that he had a heart for other people. While Jesus was here in his earthly form, he worked to understand people where they were and administer them appropriately. He taught them about the ways of God and he gave them a vision about the abundant life that they could experience as they yielded their lives to the Father. Now, like Jesus, we can't control what other people think about us, but you can control your own actions. You can control your attitude, how you respond to certain situations. And we can choose to positively affect other people and that's how you find favor with folks. Developing such a, a balanced life is one that we must con constantly mature in, in our wisdom, in our stature, in our favor with God and men. Now, I'm not going to lie to you this morning and say, okay, if you just do these four things, it gets really, really easy, and everything is going to be a piece of cake for the rest of your life, because that's not the truth. You guys know that. I would be a fool to get up here and try to tell you that. Nothing ever comes easy. In fact, it takes hard work. To be a Christian takes commitment. It takes perseverance. It takes day in and day out you getting up in that morning and dying to the self and yielding your life to God. But when we do that, what happens is God promises to work in you and God promises to be there to carry you along the way. 
Jesus says here, we see in the passage, as he's young and he's gone with his parents to Jerusalem, they leave him. And he's missing for three whole days. Listen to Mark Lowry here. It's been a, a few days ago. You guys know the Christian comedian. He's asking the question. I want to know how Jesus' mother left him there for three days and didn't know if he was gone. Traveling in a big crowd. It would be easy to lose a child. And when they finally come back to Jerusalem and they're searching there in the temple, they find him there with the teachers of the law and they ask him about his disappearance. And he says... Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Let me think about that for just a second. Now, now, I'm sure that Mary, by this time, knew that there was something special about this child. We've been reading through the book of Luke, and we see all these interactions with, with Anna and Simeon and the shepherds, and, and the wise man came in there somewhere. And she's hearing all of these things, and, and it tells us in each of those passages, just like it does here, that she treasures all of these things up. But I don't know if she knew exactly what all of this meant. We don't really even know when Jesus for sure began to realize about his whole ministry and how this was all going to unfold. But there is one thing that is very clear from even a young age. He is fully committed to God's will. He is fully committed to following where the Father is leading. Remember that unwavering commitment continues to characterize his life all the way to the cross. Perhaps that's the best demonstration that we could follow. Jesus will later tell his disciples when he's speaking to the Samaritan woman, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And beloved, that's why we're here, to accomplish the will of God, to do the work that God has laid before us. You guys are in unique positions to do the things that God has laid before you, just like I'm in a unique position to get up here and do the things that God has laid before me. And if we want to develop a balanced life and start this new year off right, it has to begin with the same unwavering commitment to follow after God. If we don't do that, church, we just get stuck in the rut. We stay in the same old place. You know, they say insanity is doing the same old thing and expecting a different result got to follow God and step out into new areas of life. And trying to do this in our own strength and power, all we're going to do is spin our wheels. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I would guess that most of us have tried to do that before. We've tried to do things in our own way. How many times have you committed to starting off the year by reading the Bible every single day? And then a few weeks in, something comes up and it breaks the habit. It only takes one day. And you get out of the habit. How many times have you committed to eat a healthier diet and get more exercise? And then maybe a few days in, something comes up. Got all that left leftover Christmas candy sitting around the house. Well, I don't want it to go to waste. <laughs> And you break that cycle. See, we're not alone. And so if we're committed to get healthy, if we're committed to be more spiritual, if we're committed to be socially better, then we have to do what is necessary to provide a place for God's Holy Spirit to dwell within us richly. Church, you have to commit to reading this word because you truly desire to know what it says. And what God wants for your life. And if you need help doing that, then you get help. You get an accountability partner. You come to the church. You get in a Bible study. And all of those things then begin to help you develop the character that you know that God wants you to have. An unwavering commitment to do the will of God. See, Jesus did not grow because he isolated himself somewhere off on a mountainside. 
We find that he does that from time to time. But for the most part, we find that he is connecting with people. We see him interacting with others at the temple here in this passage. You see, he intentionally sought out teachers that were there so that he could ask questions. He listened to them. He asked the hard questions. And then he also answered them when they asked him questions. And what it tells us here is people were amazed. I think that's a great testimony again to the teaching that his parents had upon him in their home. At least the first 12 years of his life. He completely understood the importance of connecting with other people. Which again is why I'm so puzzled that a lot of Christians think we can grow spiritually outside without being a part of a local body of believers. Writer of Proverbs says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So God, what God does is He uses me and He uses you and He uses other people around us to knock off all those rough edges that we have. Shape us into these sharp instruments that will do His will. One of the other things that we see here is in less than one chapter, Jesus goes from being a baby to a 30-year-old man ready to carry out God's plan. You guys understand that there's a process there. We read it in just a few short verses, but it takes at least 30 years before he begins ministry. And I think a lot of times we jump in here, especially at new believers, and we jump in and we say, okay, I'm ready to get started, I'm on my way. And we expect things to be like a microwave. When in reality, it's more like a crock pot. You know, I got a stew at home. If I want it cooked today, I'm going to put it in a frying pan or something. If I want it really, really good, stick it in the crock pot. Let it sit there for a day or maybe two. And it's really good. You see, we need time to prepare. We need time to grow. We have to go through this process. And it doesn't happen overnight. There's a single word there in verse 52. A lot of times we overlook it. It's the word increased. NASB actually translated kept increasing. And what it pictures is it's someone advancing in momentum like they're cutting through thick brush. And we don't like that thought. We don't like that effort. But a lot of times that's what your faith takes. It takes you day in and day out hacking your way through faith. And it's a process that develops over a lifetime. And so again, don't expect this to be easy. If we want to mature, it often goes as we require to, to work at it through all of the distractions in life to mature in our faith. Far too often I see sincere Christ followers waiting around for some mountaintop experience that they think is just going to make everything all that better. And in most cases, those are just moments in time in a grand scheme of things. And so as we close today from this passage and start this new year, I want to encourage every single one of us here to seek God. Continually go to God's work and walk on your journey as we develop spiritually. To seek his wisdom and his understanding on how to apply it. To live as healthy as we possibly can for his purposes. And to grow in his grace. And in the eyes of others around us. So that as we do this, day by day, we're getting closer and closer to his kingdom coming. And learning to be more like our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word that you give us. Father, we start off this new year. Lord, we just ask for your wisdom. Father, we know that it's here in your word. We pray that, that, that you help us to grow in that. Father, we seek stature as well. We know each one of us has this one body, this one life. Father, help us to live it to the full. Lord, help us to grow in favor with you, Father. We seek to please you. You are our Heavenly Father, Father. We, we give you all the glory and praise, and Lord, we want to do what you have called us to do. And Father, as we do that, 
Help us to seek favor with others around us. We become the hands and the feet of Jesus. We ask all this in your mighty name. Amen. Let's stand. All of that takes time. To speak for the Lord. Feed on his word. Let's remind ourselves as we sing. Take time to be holy, speak oft with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, help those who are weak, for good and in is blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to growth in our youth I think we see tremendous growth in our church Stan will you dismiss us in a word